persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is our, excuse me, great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you, including, of course, John the Baptist, who by Jesus Christ's own words said he was the greatest prophet. Consider this this morning as we look at this text. We're going to look at the front half of each one of these. The back half of them would tie together with fulfilling them in the tribulation period as a Jew. But truly in applying these in our lives and looking at what it would mean to have a blessed life, so many people want to have a blessed life. Now, having monies and living in America, that's where God ordained us to be. Thank you, God. But when you and I understand a little bit about what God would have us to have in the blessed life, sometimes we've got to go back to instructional league. Again, why did I use that terminology? When I was drafted in 1980 uh, by the Orioles, um, I found uh, something I was a big surprise. What a big surprise. Hey, we'd love to have you come to instructional league. You think, wow, that's great. It's after the season, and uh, they say that it's probably the 30 or 40 best players that they're the lower minor leagues, and they're really the big prospects of the organization. So you go, wow, this is great. I'm going to go down and play some ball in September and October in Florida. What could be better? You know what your pay was for that? $3 a week for laundry. And since I never did laundry, that three bucks was big. <laughs> Just like spring training. I'm not. Am I telling the truth? I'm telling the truth. You got a place to live, and they fed you. Woohoo! Yay! By the first or second, third day, I went, instructional league, nah. Well, you're one of the best players. Why would they bring you down to instructional league? What was it for? The instructional league was for the best players, the best prospects, and they were brought together for what? Improving their skills, to receive personal, intentional, and specific training to make them better. Why? Because if you make them better at the lowest minor league level, then they're going to be better in the next level, the next level, the next level, and on and on they go. It's going to be a good thing. But again, some things have to go on for you to realize how much of a benefit instructional league is going to be. What was it for? The basics. What are the basics? The values you fall back on when the pressure of life hits. What are your basics today? What are your basics? Are they my salvation in Jesus Christ? I know I'm saved, and the Bible teaches me that I have eternal security. What about baptism? We had baptism last week for a young man. Man, was he, is he excited or what? He actually walked on the water, then he sunk, and that's why Bobby had to pick him back up. As a young man getting saved at a young age, he's what now, seven? He's excited. Baptized, you know about baptism. Your basics. You believe the Bible to be true. The Holy Spirit of God came into you. These are your basics, right? Okay. So the basics are the values you fall back on when the pressure of life hits. Has any pressure of life hit you recently? What are you falling back on? Is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ still as relevant to you today as it was when it saved you 30, 40 years ago? The power of the death, burial, and resurrection. We had a grand time in the Lord to celebrate Jesus Christ and Charles Inselman yesterday. And the part of it that was the grandest was it was centered on Jesus. And Bobby preaching the message of what God called him and directed him to speak. The, the young men coming up here to play music, our songs we sung together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. To That's your basics. I sure hope you have your basics down to fall back on them because if your basics are in something other than the Lord, when the pressures of life hit, it's going to be tough. What about... Your fundamentals. The fundamentals. You say they're the same thing as the basics. Well, I put them up here. Skills essential to success in your field of expertise. What's your field of expertise? Are your fundamentals honed? 
The Bible teaches me clearly that I'm to grow in the grace and knowledge. I'm not just supposed to just sit there and say, well, I know a little something, so are your skills in the Word of God better? I have heard more in the last few months, two, three, four months, from different people saying in an awesome way, I love this, I need to learn more about the Bible because I want to be able to tell people, give answers to people, people have questions. Thank you. Hallelujah. Join the group. I want to learn more too. So this is where we are with our fundamentals. Our skills need to be honed, right? The skills that are essential for success in your field. You know what the field is that you're in? It's the field white unto harvest. That's the field that you've been called to. That's the field that your skills need to be up to par. Fruit of the Spirit, walking in Jesus Christ, knowing the Word of God, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and give, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's what God says that your instructional league with him is supposed to produce. Maybe some basic stuff, maybe your fundamentals and your skills that are get honed. And one more thing, I think this is important. And I think about that fundamentals that, that we worked on and all the stuff that we used to do. If, if you've played any kind of baseball, you know it's the most exciting sport in the world to watch, right? Amen. I'm boycotting, by the way, right now. I am so mad at them. What are they doing? Boy, what are you putting cardboard cutouts in those? What are you doing? But in this exciting game of baseball, you have to constantly be working on your fundamentals. Covering first base, ground balls back to the pitcher, throw it to second base for a double play. Important. Because sometimes the shortstops get mad at you when you don't give them a good throw. But we don't get into that very much because of this right here. My attitude. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do it. Instructional league sitting down at this teaching this morning, and when the multitudes and the disciples sat down at this teaching 2,000 years ago, I wonder about their attitude. Because you know our attitude. If you look up the word, it talks about your position or your disposition or your posture of the mind proper position of mind that ensures learning. Our young boys and girls having to learn like they're going to have to. I thank the Lord for teachers. I thank the Lord for the daycare people, the, the caregivers. I thank the Lord for all those that are, are going to walk in a situation where they want the kids to get their basics back and be able to fall on them and get them reinforced, their fundamental skills to be honed in the classroom, and now they need to have the proper attitude, the proper position of mind to ensure the learning, to take it in. And it's so hard. It's so tough for them. It's tough for the teachers. Hey, pray for your teachers. Pray for your communities. Let's add them more to your prayer list. And stop sending them bad emails, too, would you please? Encourage them. Because the kid's attitude, if it can be there and you can help mom, dad, that'll ensure them to grab the learning. I had a bad attitude instructionally. So bad throws, bad stuff, arm got bad, Quarter, quarter zone shot, go home, Brown, nice seeing you. We'll see you at spring training next year. The following year, I started the season of the disabled list. My career was almost over in the middle of the season. Got very fortunate, lost guy. I don't know what I'm going to do. I ended up having a good game, get called up to the next level, next level, and then, thank you, hallelujah. Got saved in 1983 by showing up in a crazy town named Rochester, New York. I have no idea how that all happened, but God's grace. Could God have orchestrated my salvation any other way? Sure, but here's my point. Jesus Christ in this place is giving instruction, principles of life. What are we going to do with it? Well, I need some back to basics. I need my fundamentals honed in, and I definitely need my attitude to be set so I can receive what God wants for me. So what do I want to show you this morning? Go back to verse number three, and let me go through each one of these. Follow along with me. I just want to hit each one of them with some applications, some good Bible stuff here, and then have you really see as I've bolded the part that is highlighted and important to our message. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now the other side of the verse, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to have a poor spirit? Is that what it's saying, or poor in spirit? It says poor in spirit. It doesn't say, I don't know, I'm going to have a good day. I'm trying a little Eeyore, but I'm probably not doing very well. So, you need Winnie the Pooh to show up. Or Tigger. The wonderful thing about Tigger is Tigger's a wonderful thing. I better slow down. Please, Lord God. So here it is. Emptying of oneself. This is the poor in spirit that Jesus is teaching here. He's not saying have a forlorn, heavy spirit walking through life. Poor in spirit means to empty of yourself so he can fill you with his spirit. Forsaking of self-confidence, self-importance, self-righteousness. Every believer in this room that's ever gone through this understands what I'm talking about. Whenever you have had self-reliance, when you have always thought, oh God, you gave me so much to do that I can just do this in the self-confidence that you've given me because you've given me self-confidence, that's good, but be careful that you don't reinforce it with the fundamentals and have the right attitude when Jesus is teaching you all over again the first things of the principles of the oracles of God that you and I need to be reminded of what it means to have this poor in spirit, spirit, Remember, a lot of people attempt to live all of these, fle- these, the, these beatitudes in the flesh. The lost world wants the golden rule to fulfill. And they want you not to judge me lest you be judged. We're going to cover that here in a couple of weeks. They want all of you Christians to act a certain way and they're going to do their certain way, but then they want to be a religious person that does everything perfectly well, but they don't have the Holy Spirit of God in them, and they're going to be a crash. They just can't do it. The Pharisees are the same way. See, without Jesus Christ's life-changing blood and his redemptive power to give you the whole, what he's done in that new life of Christ, you're a new creature, and giving you the Holy Spirit of God to live inside of you, these are not accomplishable. They're just not possible. You say, well, I want to have a blessed life. I sure hope you do. The blessing life is not lined up with what you think it is in your flesh, but in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit right now is giving you great confirmation. Blessed are they... Blessed are he, blessed are they, blessed are the poor, blessed are the merciful, each one of these. It comes back to a spirit principle. Those that are poor in spirit have the realization that my utter emptiness, my worthless in the things that I could do in the flesh, it's what precedes the moment where I lay hold on that spiritual truth of the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ. You say, well, that means I had a worthless life before I had. No, 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 no. I'm saying, spiritually speaking, in God's whole big kingdom thing, when you were lost, did you understand, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Was that your like, life, life's mantra? I don't think so. It was seek first the kingdom of me in my self-righteousness, and I will do everything according to what I'm capable of doing. And if you don't like it, you can stuff it. Amen. And I never added amen on that. But I will tell you that the arrogance in which we had as a lost person sometimes revisit us in the flesh, emptying oneself, forsaking that self-confidence and having confidence in the Lord, my self-importance and having my importance in the Lord. He can make you important. He will make you righteous and that's what he desires every day you say well he made me righteous and he imputed it into me when i got saved yes i'll cover that in a minute but he wants to give it each and every day the next one verse number four blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted is that just about mourning and going through sadness because someone has died passed away or in mourning a relationship a loss of a job a loss of something because that's where you get the mourning you get the grief That's part of it, but it's deeper than that. It really is, because Jesus Christ is saying, blessed are they that mourn, for what? What does it mean to mourn? To mourn over my sin and what it cost Jesus Christ on the cross. Awareness of one's sin. A sense of sin must be present before the remedy is ever, ever desired. I 
I know. You all know. We know. Until someone showed me that the Bible taught and God taught that my sinful way that I did stuff when I was lost is going to send me to hell, I thought I had kind of a 50-50 shot. But when someone showed me, not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but according to his mercy, he can save me. That's the difference. There's none righteous, no, not one. He was teaching me that through the Bible when someone say, hey, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But guess what? I was never aware of my own sin other than to say, I feel bad, I'm sorry. But then I get saved and I come to the Lord and every single sin is awful to me. Not because I know that I have to get over, resaved over and over again. It's because I didn't want to disappoint my Lord and Savior. As the years have gone on in my walk with the Lord, I've gotten used to myself, gotten used to my sin sometimes. Blessed are they that mourn. When I mourn over my sin and say, Lord, forgive me for just breaking our relationship and haven't talked to you in a couple of days. Haven't talked to you the way, I mean, I've asked for a few things and we've had a nice time, but I've just distanced myself. I've gotten hard in my heart. I've become self-righteous. Forgive me, Lord. When's the last time that any of us cried over our sin and mourned over the way that we've pushed God away and forgotten his grace and his mercy to us? God, forgive me for forsaking, for forsaking and frustrating your grace. The woman in Luke chapter number 7. Woo! She washed Jesus' feet with her tears of repentance. Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son came back home and he said, I just didn't sin against you, dad. Son, brother, I sinned against heaven, it says. He sinned against heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. When you and I make awareness of our sin and what it costs the Savior, it resets us to then live in his grace, live in his mercy, and walk with a life that says, Yes, Lord, I love it here than the other way. And that's what the blessed life is. I like that blessed life, don't you? I'm a lot happier. Ask everybody around here. They can tell you. Boy, he's grumpy. He ain't living the blessed life today. But you know us. It's good when a good friend will say that to you in a kind way. Usually Bobby will yell at me. Dwayne will throw something at me, but I deserve it. Blessed, verse number five, are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Now, if you look up this one, whoo, blessed are the meek. Someone said once that a simple meeting is power under control, it's a great statement. When you understand the other side of people that aren't meek, they're definitely not like our supreme example, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is the blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek when they have conformity of one's will. We have the conformity of our will. It's a focus on God's holiness. And that moves our will to be yielded unto righteousness. God's righteousness. See, this is applicable to every one of us believers. Because we're born again. We're new creatures in Christ. The reward side of it is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the principle of living the blessed life. And by the way, when you study through the Bible about blessedness, of meekness. When you study through the Word of God, do you know that some of these things appear off an awful lot in your Bible? And as it says in Ephesians 4, we're to walk with lowliness and meekness in the vocation wherewith we're called, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk worthy of the vocation we are called unto, Paul the Apostle, the prisoner of the Lord said. Because he says, hey, this meekness and lowliness is of me. The internal characteristic is really, this this meekness is a disposition of your heart. And you and I have to have an awareness, a a perception. Hey, do you know that? 
hey, it's his will. It's, it's his will that we're supposed to be after. It's his will that I'm supposed to do. So I have to look to his righteousness, and I have to say, yes, I need to yield to your righteousness, Lord. I believe this was the, te- no, I know it was the text in Romans chapter number six that uh, Pastor Josh spoke on just a couple, two or three weeks ago, and he spoke about the young people in surrender to yield, the conformity of one's will, a focus on God's holiness. It moves our will to be yielded to his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You look at verse number 20 in chapter number five. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of of heaven. It's the righteousness of God that we're after here. So the meek person, blessed are they that are meek, understands that we need to conform our will. Slow it down. Let God have his way. Don't put yourself in that position. I know I know how to do it. And say, okay, God, could you just bless this mess that I have and in my way of doing things? No, no, he's saying, Mark, you want to be blessed? Be meek. Be in a place in your life where you mourn properly, that you're poor in spirit, you'll have a blessed life. But what does it say in verse number six? Because it leads to this being hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What does it mean to be hungry and thirsty? Some of you physically know that. Maybe you've experienced that in your lives. All over this country, people are starving, having a hard time to say, just as, yeah, this country, as much as all over the world. So we respond to that. We want to meet their needs. That's good. But what about the Christians? What about believers that are just starving for God's righteousness? Now, may I ask you if you hunger and thirst for his righteousness? Do I hunger and thirst for his righteousness? It's the reality of your need. The reality of one's need. A desire for the things of God, the words of God, and communion with God. We're going to commune with God corporately in the Lord's Supper here in a little while. It's a beautiful picture of examining our own lives in light of what God has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ, and then remembering what Jesus Christ did for us. Partaking in the Lord's Supper is a beautiful thing. But it's nothing to do with this principle of saying, I want your righteousness. It is, again, a picture of what we received when the righteousness of Christ was imputed upon us, as I mentioned earlier. But there are over 300 references to righteousness in the Bible. The righteousness of faith, whereby a sinner is justified freely by divine grace. Awakened sinners have a need for this inward working of righteousness that's what we call sanctification do you hunger and thirst to be more like jesus christ or hunger and thirst to get the blankety blank next thing the blankety blank next thing to get on to the next thing to get on to the next thing and leave me alone and god bless my life come on let's just be real here we got to get it together 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 because the lost world is going more lost So the saved world needs to get more saved. You say, I need to get saved all over again? No, you and I I need to act like and live like we really truly are after the hunger and thirsting of righteousness of God. Are people gonna look at us and go, well, you're no different than me. There's nothing wrong with living a righteous life in Jesus Christ. Not self-righteous, not self-reliance, but rather complete reliance on him. That's why when you wake up in the morning, he says, I give you another day. I give you another opportunity. Here's my grace. But you want to really experience my grace? Then live your day by faith. 
Call out to me for my righteousness, and I will not just impute like I did at the moment of salvation, but I will impart righteousness. He imputes it at the moment of salvation in Romans chapter number 3, 4, and 5, and then you understand that he wants to impart righteousness continually in your life and in my life. You and I, getting a handle on this, helps us to see that there needs to be a reality of your need and my need, that I need the things of God. I love the communion with God. I love the words of God. Blessed are the merciful. Let's finish this up here. What about being blessed? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What do you think about mercy? Everybody wants mercy. Everybody wants somebody to be merciful to them. Please be merciful to me, a sinner. Yes, Lord, I call out to you to save me. Be merciful to me. I need your mercy. Well, beyond the mercy of that salvation moment, understand this. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those that are merciful. It's the humility of one's spirit and a stirring with benevolence to help those that are suffering. Think about that. It's the humility of your spirit and my spirit. It's the spirit of God working on your spirit. So there has to be a stirring to render help to those in need with benevolence to suffering. You say, well, I forgave you. That was merciful. I've, I've given you mercy a couple of times. Forgiveness comes from mercy. Mercy. Mercy is the creator of and the starter of forgiveness. But mercy does not end at forgiveness. If it was so, then Joseph would not have been merciful to his family. He would have just said, I forgive you. But he showed mercy to them. And David showed mercy. And on and on, Moses in his mercy. The Bible's filled with mercy. 49 of the 150 Psalms mention mercy. 99 references in Psalms to mercy. Mercy 275 times in the Bible. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I truly believe, I really do, that mercy is imparted to those who are merciful. You say, well, God's always been merciful to me. Understand. But you want to really see that blessed to be merciful thing happen in your life? How about if you extend some mercy to someone else? Instead of always wanting to be on the receiving end. The humility of one's spirit, a stirring with benevolence, that's to do kindness to another. Look it up. We're all to do that. You want to live a blessed life? You say, well, someone's not reciprocating it. I got you. There's a lot of people that aren't very merciful today. A lot of people that aren't very gracious. I get it. Does that mean that their statement of life is going to have more power over me than the statement of the instructionally teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the New Testament? I don't think so. Where will we be without Jesus Christ? Done. But he is everything. And the humility of one's spirit, a stirring with benevolence to help those that are suffering, that's our Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, it says in verse number eight, for they shall see God. What does it mean to be pure in heart? I love people that are pure in heart. I can identify them in a moment, being around them in the spirit, pure in heart. There's no errors about them. They're pure in heart. It's not what you see, what you get, like that type of thing. It's a sweetness. They're wonderful to be around. The purity of one's heart is someone who's committed to love the Lord without divided affections. How many lords do we love? How many idols do I put before the Lord? You see, purity in heart means that I'm committed to a deep love with the Lord and I do not have any divided affections. Well, we know that basis on relationships on this earth that we always translate things through there and we need not do that all the time. I understand that we make application in the things that we're doing on this earth, but understand the eternal pureness of heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
in what he wants for you. As he is committed to deep love for you without divided affection, he wants the same for me and you. It's, not, it's no religion, just Jesus. It's the heart of a man, a heart of a woman. It's the heart that's at the center of our personality. It involves our mind, our will, our emotions. What is it about my heart that can be pure? We're taught that in Romans chapter number one that when man's heart became foolish and fell to the things of this world, it was no longer pure. And I will tell you, in case you haven't all figured it out for yourselves already, warning, you mess with that heart, it'll be carried with you the rest of your life. Now, let God put it back together, and the heart that he puts back together, you can work with, because he will keep on working it, and he'll make it better. Because I want to have a pure heart from this moment on. I want to be pure in heart from this moment on, and I want to have that blessed life. Here's a couple more, and we're done. Blessed are the peacemakers. Don't you love when someone enters into a room and they're a peacemaker? Blessed are the peacemaker. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Does that mean that you don't fight with everybody all the time? Well, that would be nice. Because Christ is our peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Well, again, I'm attempting to make peace with people, and they don't want to make peace. They're all riding all over the streets of America. Well, it's amazing how law and, law and order on the earth, in the carnal way, has a way of stopping that. Well, how about the law of the love of Christ for us? How about the law of his mercy? How about the law of his goodness and his grace and his forgiveness? Those are his laws. You see, blessed are they, excuse me, blessed are the peacemakers. It's a serenity of one's person, a recognition of God's presence coupled with trust in his true reconciliation. Think about that. God's way of putting things back together in his reconciliatory way, Jesus Christ was the pavement. We are reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Correct? Correct. Christ is our peace. Correct? Correct. So to know Christ and to seek peace, we have to have a new view of ourselves. New view. New view of ourselves. The new view is the serenity of me as a person, peace, a recognition of God's presence coupled with trust in his true reconciliation. Guess what? My fake, false reconciliation is, hey, let's make peace. Thank you. appreciate it. Boy, I can't wait for him to stink and fall when I... When I hope his life just messes up, I hope that he just falls apart. That's not true reconciliation. Blessed are the peacemakers are those that say, I have no stake in the game other than peace. I want to make peace with you. I want to make things right with you. And I don't have to have anything. Wouldn't you like to be around some peacemakers? Why don't you become that peacemaker that's blessed as we finish this out? Look at verse number 10. Oh, verse number 10 is great. It's so sweet. You say, what do you mean? I'm going to have to go through persecution? Yeah. Those that live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, so suffer persecution. Peter has a lot to say about suffering for the Lord. He did. He really, really did a lot. And if you look up the story of those people in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, they suffered. They suffered persecution, just like the apostles. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, not for their personalities, not for my quirky things, but here's how it goes. It's the security of one's fortune. A hey, believer, do you know the fortune you have in heaven? It's incredible. God's got things laid up in heaven for you. Oh, my. I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 2. That can be applied here, but it's an eternal, powerful promise from God. 
He says, when you understand the security of your fortune, your life of persecution accompanies our living holy in the Lord Jesus Christ. I might get persecuted for making bad decisions, and I have, but being persecuted for standing for Christ and walking for Christ, it's okay. If somebody comes up and says, oh, you're just, you know, just a Jesus person. All you ever do is talk about Jesus, and, and I'm just tired of it. I say, yeah, I can understand that, but it's okay. How much persecution did Jesus Christ go through for you? For me? You know he couldn't handle it. I'm not even talking about the cross. They mocked him. They railed on him. They tried to kill him more than once. They thought they could beat him, but they couldn't because it says it's not my time. And I'll determine by my father. My father will determine by me when it's my time to go to the cross. In the meantime, a life of persecution accompanies our holy living in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay. If you think persecution is having your bank account messed up, that's one thing. But the persecution that you and I go through because we stand up for Jesus Christ, you will be blessed for that. You will be blessed beyond measure. Here's your last two verses, and I'm done. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. This behooves re-reading. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Think about the Jew in the tribulation period and what they're going to see in that. Come on now. That's the setting of this teaching. But the practical aspect is for today, for us, believer, when they persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, not for your sake, but for my sake, he says, for my sake, he says. Rejoice. And be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. This all points to Jesus. It all points to him. That's our study, Jesus Christ. And that's our Lord's Supper today, too, as always. It's Jesus. It's for Jesus. It's in Jesus. And so... Our conclusion is this, and we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper and have a great time, and if any of the teenagers want to come in, they can for the Lord's Supper. When King Jesus instructs us in his kingdom living, we need to examine ourselves and remember his suffering for us. Our Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come to you as we prepare our hearts and examine our hearts for the Lord's Supper in our communion time. I pray, God, that you receive every single bit of glory deserving of you, that we declare by the name of Jesus that you are worthy for any persecution we go through, for any heartache that we have to suffer. For your name's sake, Jesus, it's okay. And I thank you for going to the cross for me and for all of us as believers for suffering that awful, cruel, wicked death, but rising from the dead on that third day. Thank you, Jesus. And so we celebrate. We celebrate you right now in the Lord's Supper. We commune together with the things of you, God, and by the word of God. Again, God, have your way. Be blessed and be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.